a uh, little background about my myself is uh, I've had 10 years experience in the industrial refrigeration world. Uh, I've been with the Colmac family for, for over 10 years. So um, I, I know this company, I know we're gonna be around forever. So let's go through what we're gonna be reviewing today. Uh, we're gonna go through the benefits of hot water uh, generation through heat pumps. We're gonna go through the applications uh, we're going to go through how a heat pump works. We're going to go through how we design systems. I'm going to go over our sizing and selection. I'm going to go briefly over, over some plumbing arrangements. I, I'm going to cover uh, both our air source and our water source units. And uh, try to keep the questions to towards the end. Um, sometimes the next slide will answer your question. Anyway, let's get started. So the benefits of uh, hot water generation through heat pumps. Um, we know that uh, decarbonization, electrification is something a lot of cities, a lot of states are mandating, not unlike your own. Um, so you're left with a lot of uh, very few options on how to accomplish that. So your options are electricity or or you can use uh, stuff like boilers and stuff, but those those we want to get rid of because they're polluting the environment. So your other choice is electricity. If you just go full resistance heating, you're not going to get very much efficiency. So that's where heat pumps come in, and you see CO, COPs or coefficients of performance from up to one from 1.5 to six. You see incidental cooling or heating recovery load shifting and demand response, no exhaust piping or waste streams that you get with the boilers. So you, you, it's a lot easier to install our heat pumps in it and a lot less regulation than a boiler. So I, I like to refer to the boilers as the bomb in the basement because that's what they are. You're plumbing a flammable gas to them. They, they do offer some benefits as, as far as a high recovery rate. I'm going to address why why we can handle that with heat pumps a little differently and a little bit more efficiently. Um, with natural gas boilers, you have uh, gas lines to install, venting and condensate streams to worry about, and then of course there's the output in the environment that we're concerned about. And then of course legislation is driving these types of units out of your basement. So the, we want to get rid of the bomb in the basement. So. The next, the next option is electric resistance tanks. So they directly convert electricity to heat through a resistance heating element. That has problems as it's, you're only getting one unit of energy for every unit of energy you put in. Whereas the heat pumps, you get the 1.5 to six times back. So, and I'll get into what I mean by that in a little bit. Um, so heat pumps use strictly electricity. They use a refrigeration cycle that I'm going to cover here in a minute uh, to push heat from either air or water source to, to heat our water. So we use mostly, these are used in large scale applications such as multifamily housing, hotels, dormitories. Uh, surprisingly, uh, we almost exclusively do every military base, the barracks. They are a huge customer of ours. It's, we're very proud to to serve our military like that. We do schools, um, net zero locations, passive house. And uh, we, we have actually um, been recognized by LEED on multiple installations. In fact, I believe the one in the picture there is a, is a LEED accredited installation. So let's go into how heat pumps work. So you're taking heat, from a heat source, whether it's water or air. And then we're adding a little bit of electricity via a compressor. And then uh, we're taking that heat that we generated from the heat we pulled out of the air, combined with a little bit of electricity from, from a compressor. And then we're pushing that heat into your potable water. It's electrically driven. Um, capacity does depend on source temperature. So if you have a warm environment, let's just say we're in, in Hawaii, you have plenty, plenty of heat to be pulled from the air. 
And so it's really easy to take a high heat source and push it into your hot water. But we also have units that can take cold air from outside. In fact, down to negative four degrees, we can push that. We can take extract heat from that really cold air and then push it to make hot water. So systems are designed a little bit differently when, than a traditional boiler system. We pair, we pair our heat pumps with storage tanks. I like to think of these as like a battery that you're charging. So you want to have a fully charged battery when your building load just all of a sudden starts hitting hard and fast. So you'll store that water at somewhere between 140 and 160, and then you'll use a mixing valve to mix it down. So, cause you don't want any scalding to happen. And forbid a 160 degree water comes in uh, off the tap and burn some poor old lady. No, none of us want that. We uh, recommend that you use an electro electronic mixing valve. They are vastly more expensive, but they offer benefits of extreme control. Um, minus the drawbacks and the cost. I, I don't know. I don't know if I if we recommend that every single time. But if you have a research line coming into directly, and, and you have two differing pressures, differing temperatures, the electronic valves can handle that. Whereas a standard thermostatically controlled valve needs to see the same pressure at inlets, inlet and outlets to it, so that it can actually properly mix the temperatures because it's very, very mechanically driven, rather than based on a uh, real temperature sensors, temperature probes mixing it. Okay, let's go into sizing new uh, new systems. So we try to design these systems with, with higher storage and lower gallons per hour of recovery. We tend to pick arrays of units. So the arrays units does a few things for you. It, uh, it provides redundancy in off, often cases. So we design our units around low source temperatures. So we call those our design conditions. So our heat pumps will output different amounts of hot water, different capacities based on different temperatures. So if it's really warm out, it has a lot of heat that it can pull out of the air and it can output a lot more hot water. And we're directly lifting, lifting these uh, water temperatures up to 185 degrees in a single pass setup, depending on your outside air conditions for air source and your inlet source water temp for water source. So we design them around the lowest or the design point so, so that we can satisfy the building load and recovery rate that we've designed for. And then uh, often uh, during warmer times of the year, you won't need, you won't need more, more than one unit. So like in the, ta in the picture here, you see four units. On, on a nice summer day, you might only need to run one of those. And with our lead lag and staging controllers that you can set, you can set these units up to, um, they, they basically, can, they can control themselves in an array in such a manner that one unit is the master and then the rest are slaves and they will actually load, they will load share. So as soon as there's a call for heat, only one of the units may run, and they uh, they they alternate between units based on run hours. It's a really cool feature. Uh, that's a little off the point here, so I'll continue. So our approach to sizing. Uh, this is a typical load profile that you would see. The blue the blue area is is your storage. You're going to start the beginning of the day on that high peak with all your storage filled up and then everybody's gonna start waking up and then you're gonna hit your peak load. So the heat pumps actually aren't designed to handle that peak load. So their recovery rate doesn't match the peak load uh, condition that it sees. So that's where your storage comes in. Cause you've stored, you've stored up all your hot water in those tanks to handle that peak load. And of course, uh, one would need to size their uh, loop heater and research tank 
to match the recirc losses through the building. So especially if the, during low load conditions where nobody's using hot water, that water in those lines is, is going to get cooler. So we need to make sure that we're accounting for those losses. So the required design information that we need, and, and we can send out this questionnaire. It's, it's an easy to fill out form, but we need to know the source type, whether it's air or water, the min and max source design temperatures. And we have, we have a lot of information. So basically, if you tell us where, where you are, we can sort that information out for the most part. But if you had specific conditions, we, we would need to know that. So we need to know what kind of building, what kind of usage, what kind of to total daily usage or peak hourly usage. And we, and we, can, we have tool, internal tools and tools that we can share, share with everybody uh, that help, help size those. Okay, for multifamily sizing, we, we tend to go off the ASPE daily usage per person. So you can see the table to the right, 2.2 there. You can see low, medium, and high demand. So previously, uh, things used to be sized, uh, and they still are for some manner, off of fixtures. It, it, but at some point, it, it makes more sense to think about this from a people standpoint. You, you don't want to size everything in, in a multifamily building based on fixtures, because not necessarily those fixtures won't be used all the time. So it's more about how a person behaves, when they're showering, when they're cooking, when they're, what things they're doing during the day. So we, we're designing around these loads and the peaks that happen in a day, and we'll, we'll come up with a map, which is what you see on this, this previous slide here, where you see the map of usage. Uh, typically, we like to use uh, the storage to where there's 20% of remaining storage uh, during your peak load condition. Um, and of course, our, our run time of our units is based off a six, 16 hour daily run. And now if we can adjust that, we can size these units to where, to where they could be less, but we like to see a very few compressor starts. So when you turn off and on a heat pump, you only have a finite number of times you can do that, which is about 200,000 on the average compressor. So we want to make sure that we're getting long run times for charging our, our battery bank of, of storage. Okay, going through some sizing tools here. Um, and this is following the ASPE table that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, based on the number of occupants, you can see low usage and medium usage. We offer a recommended recovery rate and a storage recommendation uh, following the lines on the, on the tables on the left there. And as far as the table on the right, it's, uh, we, we, can, we can rate our units. This happens to be a CXA-10 unit. It is a 10 horsepower compressor unit. Um, the conditions you see there are from a potable water lift of 50 to 140 degrees. And then you see an array of, of different source air temperatures that and various coefficients of performance and recovery rates that this unit can, can deliver. So you can see on a very cold day, it's, it's got a low coefficient of performance, it's got a low recovery rate, but on a 100 degree day, it's got a high coefficient of performance and a high recovery rate. And of course, we offer both an axial and a plenum fan options. So axial is just typical. There's no anything special. The units stand alone. But when you off, opt for the plenum option, you can do interesting things with your unit. You can plummet and you can. So these aren't just creating hot water. On an air source unit, you, you're pulling heat out of the air, but which means you're cooling the air. So you, if you had a need for that air, that cold air, say you threw these in a mechanical room, a hot mechanical room in your basement, and you needed cooling down there. So, or if you needed to duct it to, to a system that you, or space that needed to be cold. cold. So you gotta, you got to think outside the box. And you can use these heat pumps not just to make hot water, but you can use them for chilling air and chilling water. It's a byproduct of, 
of the system. Okay, let's go into how they can operate. So they can operate in, uh, in two, different, two different methods. Let's start with the first one. This is called multi-pass operation. It has, it has higher flow and low lift. It, it does have uh, a constant flow rate. So we're running our, our recirculation pump that's in our heat pumps, full bore continuous. So it, it will vary the output temperature based on that, based on your incoming source. So it's pulling, it's pulling the cold water supply from the bottom of this tank, which is at a fairly cold temperature. And it's, it's able to raise it, let's just say to 10, plus 10 degrees Fahrenheit in this case. So, and then it's pushing it back in there. I, I believe this presentation has an animation. Let's see if it works. Okay, here we go. So you see like as it's passing, it's pouring in hot water that's giving a 10 degree TD or temperature difference. So each pass, it's, it's heating that water up a little bit more. And then all of a sudden it's starting to heat the tank. You're starting to see what's called stratification. So stratification is, uh, is how water will organize itself in a tank. You can see that the hot water is, is toward the top. And you, you can actually see this. Uh, if, if you Google stratification in the ocean, you'll see some really cool pictures of where you see the hot ocean water on the top and the cold ocean water on the bottom. And it's a very clear and defined line. So that, that stratification, you can actually measure exactly where that is in that tank. So like, let's just use the dot on this example. So the dot to the right there, let's call that your aquastat. So you, if you were drawing water out of that, you'd be able to see that stratification layer based on that temperature. You'd know when it hit that point. And if you put an array of temperature sensors up and down your tank, you'd know exactly where that stratification layer would be at all times. Okay, this is showing it go down. Okay, now let's go into single pass operation. So in single pass operation, you're not feeding into that bottom port anymore. You wanna feed that water, which is at 140 degrees, which is the temperature you want it to go to your mixing valve. So you can, you can directly use that water for single pass operation. And this is, the, this is how we recommend our, our units be set up is for single pass operation. It's combined with stratifi stratified storage. So you can see the stratification layer, the heat pump's running, it's starting to push hot water into that tank, provided that that mixing valve isn't calling, or and the building's not calling for water, because our units will actually can supply water directly to, to your mixing valve. And uh, it gives a constant temperature output, varying flow rates, minimal lift is required, um, of course, we recommend you size your pipes for the maximum flow rate. So you can see as this is filling up, it's bringing it down and see where that dot is. That's so our units uh, will see that temperature. So we have we have uh, landing points in our electrical panels and controls, and you, you all you and we even provide the temperature sensor. For you. you plug the temperature sensor in your tank, and all of a sudden we know that we need to turn off our unit because this tank is getting full. You have to forgive me. This is where I left off on. Um, I didn't get a chance to actually uh, review this uh, presentation. My apologies on that. I, I'm not certain what I'm looking at here. Uh, single versus multi-pass heating. Um, obviously, we have an internal pump in our unit, and then we have an ETCV valve, and that will actually throttle down during single pass operation. So it'll slow the flow rate through our uh, heat exchangers that are double wall and vented. So even if you have refrigerant that leaks through, it will never get to your potable hot water. So for multi-pass operation, that valve would be wide open and a single pass, it would uh, have a, a PID a loop that will control it so that you're always outputting 140 degree water or whatever set point you've chosen. Typically water storage is stored at 140 degrees that has a lot to do with Legionnaires disease and just, just safe, safety as far as um, any bacterial growth. Okay, we recommend that our, our, the storage tanks be plumbed in series. 
So this is a very typical uh, configuration. So, and you can see that there's two temperature probes, so we can actually know what the temperature in each each probe is. So as we as we if we start seeing different temperatures, we can actually do uh, staging of our units. So based on those two temperature uh, probes, we can tell our unit to turn on if the, if the tanks are ever hit each either one of those points, and we can have delays. Uh, let's say it, it, as as the water is getting uh, getting filled up with cold water and uh, and and the building is being called out to the mixing valve and those tanks. I, I wonder if this has an animation. Nope, it does not. Okay. And as that layer comes up, it, that temperature first temperature sensor is going to tell tell the unit, hey, I've I've saw this temperature, and you get to define what that temperature points at. As soon as and as as soon as there's, you can either have it turn on right there, or you can set a delay. So you can set a delay for it to so it so it's using more of your storage and not running your heat pump. And then you can do the second stage in the same manner, where you can either have it go off on a temperature or have it be delayed. It's very very powerful functionality in uh, in your PLC controls. Okay, uh, so this is what I was talking about earlier with the lead and uh, lad or lag. So, so we have a parent unit that will control an array of units. So they'll work in unison to, together to to maintain the storage volume. Um, as for uh, fittings, this is a typical arrangement that we we recommend. It's uh, it's actually necessary for for proper applications of our heat pumps. You need to have this valving set up. So the starting with the globe valve and a strainer, you want to make sure your water is uh, clean going into your heat pump. Um, I, there's particular uh, numbers for for that that we recommend. That's in our installation operation manuals, and can be found in most manufacturers' uh, installation operation manuals. Um, it's very important that we have uh, vented valves so that we can purge any air from the system. These are often uh, where the heat pumps are on the roof and your tanks are in the basement. Um, so it's very important that you vent any air out of out of that system. Um, depending on how you set up a system, you can you can set it up in a number of ways. This is a very typical stratified storage um, research setup uh, that's very typical. So you see the cold water can come in, and it it gets fed to the either the bottom of the tank or to the heat pump if it's calling if it's calling for a pool, and it will backfill that tank. Uh, your recirc water comes in from the bottom bottom on the bottom uh, right of the of our screen. We see the returning water at 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That actually will get reused. Part a portion of it, less than 20 percent, will get shoved back into your storage tank, and the, the remainder of that will actually go directly to your mixing valve. So this elaborate or uh, adds an additional bit to that. What's called a research tank. Uh, a, a lot of people end up calling it a swing tank. There, there's a conflicting terminology or additional terminology. So to handle your research load, you can you can also set up a, a little heat pump, to, and we would recommend our smallest heat pumps in this scenario uh, to handle that research load. The research load could also be handled with a research tank with a, an electric resistance heater. Or if you were designing your system, system where you had like an existing boiler, you could use the boiler as like a backup, and you could also use it to handle your, your research load. Oh, this goes in that. Okay. So this is more or less what I was just talking about where, where you're so this is the bit that got added on. So this is the bit I was describing in the previous slide. Uh, so for your research tank, though, you, you would use a heat pump in a multi-pass setup, just by the nature of how that tank, how it attaches to that tank, and how it interacts with the rest of the system. 
So most people just use on smaller systems will use electric just just because it it, it would take a very very small um, heat pump to to handle a, a small building's recircle losses. And if the building has a lot of call, chances are that's not going to have to run anyway because it'll have enough flow going through the whole system that it will that it will maintain a higher temperature in that tank. So we do offer cascade systems. So essentially you're taking your cold weather air source heat pump and you're using it to preheat water. So it's it's combining in, in this case with a water source heat pump where the water source is preheating the source loop and it's going outside to this uh, the cold weather air source unit and then it's coming back through a buffer tank then finally through uh, back through the um, the water source heat pump to provide your hot water. So these cascade systems could, can handle extreme temperatures of water, so you can have very high outputs. So you you can see out there we're we're, we're advertising 180 degrees. There and there's certain cleaning and applications where where our customers will want really hot water. Say it's an industrial process where they want to do wash down and they need it to be a certain temperature. We can do that with these cascading systems. Uh, retrofit considerations. Um, initial work could include metering usage and losses. Uh, as I was saying before, you, sometimes uh, people will choose to leave the old equipment as as a backup or Perhaps it's a, in an area where uh, you've installed uh, heat pumps that are air source and your source temperatures go below the operating conditions that the heat pumps can, can operate at and you need an additional system to, to make up for those times of the year. That's, uh, that's where you can leave the old equipment and you can reuse tanks. Often we'll, 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 you'll want to look at the plumbing system the way that old boilers and storage were, were, are plumbed isn't necessarily how you want to plumb a system with heat pumps. And of course, there's electrical service limitations as well. If obviously, if you don't have power, it's, it's uh, something that needs to be addressed to, to apply our heat pumps. The, the good news about heat pumps versus uh, electrical resistance with that coefficient of performance, you're probably not going to have to put in as much power service as you think. Okay, let's go over some some specific units here. Um, so uh, we have a new CX series of units out. They are their air source, water source, and uh, air source with low temperature. So we have the exact same controls across all the models. They have a easy to use PLC touchscreen. We utilize modern uh, Corel valves, uh, electronic expansion valves, which is what EEV stands for. Uh, that enables us to have very, very precise control uh, over, over the refrigerant system that's driving, driving this, uh, the heat change. So, so it's taking heat from air, taking heat from water in the most advanced way possible to deliver hot water. Uh, we use we only use 304 stainless cabinets as per standard. Uh, all of our units are outdoor rate rated because of this. Uh, we also have a 316th stainless steel option uh, for atmospheres where you'd want that are coastal with heavy salts. So manufacturers need to be offering outdoor rated in both 304 and 316 stainless to properly apply these in all environments outside. Um, our units uh, and and our and many other um, of our competition's units um, have interconnecting controls. Ours is unique in the sense that it's a little smarter. We can we can do units in arrays and they all work in unison. They they're they're designed and programmed to work together. We have uh, capa our heat pumps from five to thirty horsepower. So we have we have big units. We have small units. They, they're, they're designed to work together and arrays are designed to be stacked and put together side by side. They have an intelligent defrost strategy for the air source units. So 
So getting into the controls, which is an important part of your heat of what you need to be thinking about while you're picking a heat pump, you want to think about what it can do for you, what kind of information it can provide for you, how easy it is to use. Uh, ours in particular it will give you a trending history of how it's been operating, so you can easily identify uh, different load conditions in your building. You could, it gives you real time estimates. Of performance, it gives you real-time information about what's happening on your system. And uh, the, the screenshot to the left sh shows you some of that information that you can pull from our unit. And you can actually take that information, plug in a USB, pull it off to us, send it to us, and we can take a look at how your system's operating. So say you had different loads that you didn't account for, or like, oh, we need to add in a a restaurant to our bottom floor of our building. And then that, that's gonna change the load profile and how, and how these need to run. So if you give us that information, maybe we can help you set up or maybe we can sell you another unit to add to the array. Um, anytime there's software updates, it's super easy to plug in a USB right on the face of the unit and you press one button and it loads new code for you. Very, very simple to use. Um, we offer cloud-based monitoring. So for uh, people that don't want to be at their building, that you can, you, can, you can use the cloud. So you can either use the cloud via cell phones, or you can click, uh, connect it to your building internet. Uh, and then it will communicate through through Modbus uh, between all of the array of units and feeds you that information via emails and text alerts. And you can log in and uh, and look at everything that it's doing. So you get to you get to see and and uh, a lot of contractors and and our rep network they provide support for our units. And they will look at this stuff on the daily. They, they'll log in, they'll look and see what your unit's doing, see if you have any code alarms. Uh, so, so we're there looking at our units on a daily basis uh, to make sure they're operating as intended. For our low temperature units, which is we call our CXV series, so they use a different refrigerant. Most of our standard units use 134A. These will use 410A. So 410A uh, has a different envelope that it can operate at. It's much more suited for lower temperatures. But that also means it needs defrost. So uh, you, you can do that in a couple of different ways. You can do that with electric resistance or hot gas. Our unit units uh, use an advanced hot gas system. Um, very powerful and fast. So you can see the units literally defrost right in front of your eyes. Um, our, for our CXA units, uh, we have a we have a variety. So this is this is our small five horsepower unit that you see here on the screen. And as we go up, we see that the 10 through the 30 here gets a little bit bigger. We've designed these units to to, to easily be installed. Uh, you notice that it's a tall unit, uh, but it's not any wider than a than a, than a um, maintenance or service door. So with that footprint, you're not going to have to buy a crane or rent a crane to to lift it onto the roof of your building. It'll it'll go in your service cellars. It'll get through go through your service doors. It um, it uses ECM fans or, or it's permanent magnet uh, fans that. Uh, can be controlled with a zero to 10 volt signal. They're very efficient, uh, externally communicated motors. That's what that stands for. And uh, that's on our both our axial and plenum, plenum fans. Plenum fans being the, the ducted version of these units, you can actually plumb ducting to these units, inlet and outlet, to where, to where you can pull air from outside and, and install these indoors or in your basement, in your boiler room. Uh, we offer electro coated. Uh, Electrofin is a is a particular brand that w we go with. Uh, it offers a, a increased um, corrosion resistance. Oh, here's illustrating uh, our old units versus our our new units. So, uh, as I was talking about the service door, 
Our new units are designed to go through a service door. Um, they're vastly improved as far as space saving design. They're easy to maintenance. They, they're, and, and, I, and I think there might be some slides that get into that. Oh, here we go. So, so there's zero side clearance required. Uh, there's a slide out tray. All of the refrigerant lines are on flexible refrigerant lines. So you, if you need to service or change any of our components, our, these units are, can, it can be easily done. So here are some of the dimensions of, of a CXA air source unit. Uh, the unit on the, or the picture on the right is, shows it with a plenum fan option. On the left, we have the axial option. And these are some water source units. They go from 9 to 25 nominal tons. Uh, there's a single compressor. It's, it's stackable. It has single point electrical and interconnecting headers. And, and we'll actually even sell you those interconnecting headers. Now, I'm trying not to make this too sales pitchy, but this is important information about heat pumps in general as well, as, as, as far as how you can order them, how you need to be able to set up the piping systems. Uh, and, and we'll do we'll give you a lot of tools, including interconnecting piping provided to, to, to make the ease of installation of the heat pumps very much more streamlined. So this is illustrating the fact that it fits through a doorway, um, showing well, old versus new unit there. How hot can your water source heat pump go? Like if you were combining? Uh, we can. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, up to 185 degree water. Uh, and depending on your source temperature, you may need to use a cascading kind of system to, to hit those temperatures. So you can imagine doing like a five ton a cold like negative four temperature heat pump getting it up to say 100 degrees fahrenheit and then doing a water source heat pump to take it up to 180 right or or vice versa on on how it's how it plumbs through so you might use your 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 um water source to to preheat for your air source which kind of it ends up being, as you saw on that slide, you, you see that it's it's two two sides to that. So you, it sees the benefit on both sides because it goes through the one through the one through the second one and then back through the first unit. So it's. I see. Well, I, to be honest, the plumbing diagrams sometimes are a little bit beyond me. I was just commenting on that quietly over here to my coworkers. Like, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I just pretend. So um, I probably missed that. Thanks. That's that's where you want to give us a give us a shout on email. We'll we'll answer your questions. We'll go through. We'll sit down and we'll talk with you, and we'll talk through these systems. Right. So okay. Well, thank you. All right. Let's go through a sequence of operation. So with a master slave configuration, you have a lead heat pump and you have a slave heat pump. Um, each one responds to the tank temperatures and stages. We, we've covered that a little bit. Each stage acts individually. The number of heat pumps, a number of heat pumps can be assigned to each stage. So if you, if you know that uh, stage one you've defined has two heat pumps on it, it'll tell, if it has a call for heat, it'll start up two units. So, and it does balance the uh, run hours between. So it, it's picking two, two units and it's picking across that array based on the number of run hours. So it's gonna pick the unit with the least amount of run hours. And then it's gonna balance the run hours across all those units. Of course, uh, um, these are also set up to where they can be run permissive, where all you have to do is, is connect two terminals together, whether that's with an Aquastat or some other building controls. So these can be used, all the technology that's built into our units can you don't necessarily have to use that if you're tying it into an existing system or if you have a, a bms system or some other building controls that that you want to use to run that the heat pump how am i doing on time did i did i shoot through this quickly enough <laughs> good question 18 minutes. oh you've got 18 minutes left you did shoot through it all right let's 
let's field some questions then. All right then. Well, we will wait for them to come in as we go, but um, I have seen that you've got product all over the world. Like, I, I'm not sure if you still have it on your website, but I downloaded previously that you were selling in Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia. And, and how did that happen? And Guam and, and yes. <laughs> like, I, who's selling your product on the other side of the planet? Uh, we have international reps. Uh, one of our reps is uh, located actually in California down there in Irvine. Uh, RNK International, they, uh, they do a little bit of work for us. We, we've done military bases all around the planet as well. So, I see. So you might have done a base and then uh, someone nearby is like, hey, look what they did over on the base. Hmm. Okay. Yep. Once you, once you start working with the contractors like that, it's, 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 they do one, one installation, they get really comfortable with it, and they see how easy everything went together and how painless the process was. They start applying them in other locations especially in, in very hot, hot areas where the outside air temperature is a great sink uh, uh, to pull heat from. I see. So pulling heat from, so in hot climates particularly, as you're pointing out. Okay. Um, there's a question here from Nico C. Is, is it possible to orient tanks in basement and air source heat pumps on the roof? What considerations do we need to account for? Yes. Yes, you can. So there is, there is something you need to consider, though. So our internal uh, pumps will control and circulate water through our units. But if you have a long run between the basement and your roof, you might need a booster pump. Other than that, there's not a whole lot else you need to consider. You need to consider the, 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 the losses in the pipe. You're going to want to insulate them very well so that when the water gets to where it needs to be, it's not different than what you thought it should be. Okay. That's a good answer. Um, I was thinking, it, how is, I mean, it, if you don't mind, just sort of generally speaking, how is market growth for you? Like, I, I, you know, I've gone to a lot of hot water forums where manufacturers have complained that air source heat pumps were only 1% of the market and why would they invest in it and cetera. But you guys are a specialist. This is what you're doing. And I'm wondering, okay. uh, yeah, how's it going? So on that line, um, the demand is getting out of control. It, uh, with the electrification that we're seeing, we're seeing cities, we're seeing states, we're, it's going to be regulated into a mandatory nature. So we're getting inundated with with requests, and at this point, we're we're all about educating everybody, because right now there's there's a whole lot of confusion on how to apply these and how to make them work, and we're here to help. With the regulation that's driving this, we're seeing a huge demand. One of my projects, um, the engineers, it was their first Colmac, and they ended up designing it like a boiler, where they put forty tons. And then uh, each 20 ton system had 400 gallons of storage. And the gallons of storage were downstairs, the heat pumps were up on the roof, even though this is new construction. It, so it's just a really, a ton of capacity and very little storage relative to, you know, the 35 apartments that they're supporting to have, you know, just a few hundred, 400 gallons of, of water stored. So just looking at that, um, you know, this big compressor, relatively small storage, you know, sort of upside down as to what would be an ideal design. That was their first effort. And I appreciate you, you know, going through your sizing. Um, so a question I have for you. If you, and I'm not sure if you're an expert in sizing yet or not, because I realize that you just come over onto this side of the company, so just no pressure here. But uh, my question is around, volume of hot water per apartment um, or bedroom or occupant or however your, your scaling is. Um, uh -huh. How much water are you trying to store per household? I've seen, for instance, storage volumes between 12 gallons and 40 gallons per apartment. Um, and so I, storage is very much important to, cons I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, and on the B2 capacity side, I've seen between like a thousand 
and 4,000 PTUs of capacity per apartment um, on a central system. So that, that's like these large ranges. And I've been trying to get a handle on, uh, and Sean you know, Orm is gonna present, um, I believe tomorrow, right? Uh, he's gonna present on his sizing. I did some sizing presentation this morning. I, I wanna get your thoughts on, um, on storage volume and BTUs uh, per apartment or bedroom. How do you guys do this metric? As far as my understanding of it is, is we take we take the load profile that we have, and based on that peak usage, we want to design our storage to where after that peak is done, we still have twenty percent remaining in our tanks. So that's 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 the we're sizing that volume based on that. Um, if a lot of a lot of customers will have specific space requirements, and they might not necessarily be able to handle. Uh, a large sum of storage so they will use bigger heat pumps that are capable of much higher recovery rates so they can basically feed the system minus a minus the peak where you have to rely on your storage a little bit so yeah. that's for if you have small storage so yeah. but if you have an ideal setup you would want to set up your storage in such a manner that those heat pumps are running for a good 15 hours to 18 hours a day. So you're, you're utilizing your equipment that way. And it's combined with a sufficient amount of storage is going to get you a, a very efficient system. And it's also going to, it's, it's going to struggle in here, but um, it, it's just going to give you an overall system performance. That's more desirable. I like that. So your, your goal, the way you think of it, is 16 to 18 hours a day of system operation with the right sized amount of volume. And that's a general goal for how your, your product gets used. Okay. Right. Cool. And we can vary from that too, but that is generally what we recommend. And I know of like three or four different ways in which engineers regularly size that question. So that's why I'm like, okay, but I appreciate your, your perspective. Like you're the manufacturer, you think of it as like operating 16, 18 hours a day and you're responding to a lot of different engineers. Okay. Pardon me, there's questions over here. Uh, Richard Thompson, where are you getting your load profiles from? Oh, there you go. Where are you getting your load profiles from to size the tanks? Or are they specific to each residence or a general one? So uh, we we'll, we'll use ASPE numbers and based on the, the low, medium, and high usage numbers for, for private residences like that, we'll use it based, based off, off those numbers. So um, th it. those numbers uh, account for um, different profiles. So, so affordable housing isn't the same as some other style of housing. So multi multifamily or family housing versus low income housing they have different load profiles so low income housing people are tend to be home more often they're they're using their hot water while they're there so it's, it's the profiles differ from from each style that you set up and you know, and then you can do you need to take into account uh the diversity of the building too so it might it might have a a coffee stand on the main floor it might have a different different businesses in the bottom that use have different needs for the hot water. And if, if you're designing for the, for a single central system, you want to take all those things into account. So some of it could be sized based on the usage. Some of it could be sized on a process. Obviously restaurant, like a restaurant has very different usage than call it an office space. And I'm thinking, um, you know, because there are those various different sizes. You said, what, I think ASP, that went by a little bit quickly. I mean, when you were showing this. Uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry, let me. Uh, it's American Society of Plumbing Engineers. Okay. So ASPE. And so you use. They, they have a lot of. PE. Go ahead. So it, and they have, they have materials like calculators there that are the. Uh, arguably the appropriate ones for for different conditions yes they give you a lot of formulas and a lot of uh, tools to to for different demographics for different classifications of 
of spaces. Thank so, you. like, if we, if we were to go through, like, the high, medium, and low, so, like, a high demand, uh, their assumptions are no occupants work, public assistance, and low income, family and single parent households, high, high percentage of ch children, low income, uh, whereas compared to medium uh, demand, where it's families, public assistance, singles, and single parent households. And then low demand uh, would be like couples, uh, high high population density, so very very uh, big buildings with a lot of a lot of occupants. Um, middle income ha uh, housing, seniors. Uh, uh, it assumes one person works and one person stays at home. And, and so for low demand, uh, it also includes all occupants work as an option. It obviously, if nobody's there, nobody's going to be using water. Okay, I wanted to go find those calculators. Thank you for um, uncovering them for me. I wasn't aware because that's a lot of very sophisticated assistance with with load sizing. Um, uh, specifically, I would recommend CEU two two one as a document. See. So it's the title is Domestic Hot Water Systems. It's a very very useful uh, tool. It, uh, just say that slowly. I'm going to type it into the um, the chat here. So say it again. Okay. That's so. So it's domestic hot water systems. Uh, you can go to ASPE.org to to learn more about that. Okay. So. And. Um, and then you had like it was a CC. What was that that acronym there? C. Uh. Uh, on the document that I'm looking at, it's CEU space 221. That's the, uh, the document number. Okay, CEEU space 221, correct? Nope, CEU, only one E. Ah, too late. Okay, well, I, at least I have it down there. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so um, we, no, I got that question there. Okay. So um, we have about five minutes left. Um, I think it'd be just fine if, um, if anyone needs to take a break for a moment. And are there any other comments you wanted to make, Eric? Because, oh, I want to do this. Like, yay, good job, good job. Thanks for Thank you. Whole, whole My first time. presentation, everyone. <laughs> Woo, you did it. Um, thanks very much. So um, you're oh, very welcome. I have another question for you. Now, um, I was asked by Brian, I think, before he moved on to other pastors, um, he wanted to know, like, hey, Sean, what do you think is the right refrigerant for us to be going into? And I was like, definitely CO2. That's, that seems to be the answer all over the world. And the, the other refrigerant options are not that great of ideas for various reasons. Um, like. So they're flammable or they're super dangerous, you know, like CO2, other than being difficult to pressurize and you're having some issues with um, using it for any sort of multi-pass, of course, just single pass. Uh, but I'm wondering uh, when might you guys pull out a CO2 heat pump version? That, that is definitely in the works. Woohoo! Uh, we, uh, we, we're definitely excited to start using CO2. Uh, there's definitely a need for units that can operate in lower temperatures. Uh, you're located in California, right? So CO2 wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for California. And, and I don't know what our company or the company I work for now is stance on it, but I've, in the industrial refrigeration world, I had to work with CO2 quite a lot. And I can tell you that anything over about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, the, the refrigerant was critical. So, and the pressure spike like, massively. Like, so. Is that what you mean, outside temperatures? So on an 86 degree day, if yeah. you have your CO2 sitting there, it's going to be sitting in over a thousand psi. So they go and and it ramps up quickly past that. So that's the point where where it becomes uh, transcritical or critical, mm -hmm. which is why you don't want to apply CO2 in warm atmospheres. You you just simply don't. The coefficients of performance are going to tank hard and fast. Uh, well, okay, so as far as using it. So it works great as a low temperature refrigerant. I, well, we have field data in Sunnyvale, which is um, the South Bay of the Bay Area. It's you know, part of the Silicon Valley, sort of generally. 
of Sandins. We've been collecting it for about a year now of their COPs. And we're finding COPs about 4.5, 4.2 4 to 4.5 in all the months until we get to November. And then it does go down, but that's in the colder months, and it goes down to 3.5. And that's, keep in mind, this is cold. Now, keep in mind, everybody's ratings on, for COPs are, are a little different. So True. if I'm you don't account for every electrical component in your, in your heat pump, you're really not truly giving it a, an accurate COP. Well, so, field uh, rate. I mean, we have a whole bunch of them deployed at apartments, and we're studying you know, BTUs out, electricity in, and you know we got sensors up the yin yang, and we're using Colmac controls to try to control these sand and products because they don't have their own um, integrated controls like you guys do have right. a control system. So credit to you, you guys definitely have the superior controls for just managing an array of heat pumps. Um, but I just also want to say that our our data is that they range between three point five and four point five seasonally. So far, so that's good. incredible. So far, so good. I mean, Sandin's been doing it for a long time. Um, you know, that company, just generally the CO2 heat pumps come out like in 2001 or so over in Japan. That's a while now of them getting better at whatever they're up to. Um, I, so, I, but it's good I personally, out with, you said it though, like you guys are coming out with a CO2 heat pump. Well, leaving aside the, the climate appropriateness of it, I'm curious, do you have a sense, is that next year, three years from now? Uh, I'm sorry, well, I, I, I don't have that information quite yet. I okay. haven't been in part of those talks yet. It's all right. I, I'm just, you know, I'm very curious. I don't have any stocks in anyone. I just want to know. <laughs> I also want to know. I, 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 so I did a research project when I was in college uh, looking into propane. And uh, propane compressors is obviously the, the limitation right now, but the coefficients you, of performance you can get and the compression ratios that you can accomplish with propane makes it the perfect refrigerant for the entire uh, operating range that the heat pumps would be applied in as far as air source units. And it's a global so potential of I, three, so it's a super awesome chemical, except that it's, yep. And I agree. I mean, if people are going to put natural gas through all the walls of a building or just have a little bit of inside of a machine, I mean, isn't it okay to have it inside of a machine? But uh, it's Yeah, it is. So where, where people get scared is it's under pressure. Right. I hear you. Uh, but you, you throw, you, you throw a, a, a tiny amount of propane on, on a unit on your roof. Uh, let's think about a barbecue for a second. Well, no, so we're there. throwing... Okay. I just we had to we're throwing a 20 pound bottle of propane which is vastly more than what our units would have even on a larger unit and you're having an open flame above it so that's going to be vastly more dangerous than than a, than a heat pump and nobody's afraid of their barbecue so yeah which is i i i am a little bit afraid of barbecues but i take your point that it's a lot less that's in the heat pump so um i should transition over to ann because this is her turn and I just want to say, I, yep, okay. sorry for going over. No, no, you did a terrific job. There's a moment there's like, oh, how are we going to fill five minutes? We obviously got our five minutes filled. Thank you so much. Yay. Good job. Good job. Thank uh, you so much for having me. I appreciate the time you've been giving me. Absolutely. Um, well, take care. So, Anne. You too. You are a presenter and I'm unmuting you. Um, I'm trying to unmute you. There you are. Can you say hello to us? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, would you be able to share your screen with us? Yes, I would. Okay. Oh, the other one has to stop sharing first. Oh, okay. Um, there we go. Okay. 